Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CMT UK conference for 2023. Um, I'd like to say a welcome to, to members, to the non-members, medical professional students, uh, everyone who's with us today and from all over the world, uh, it would seem. Um, thank you for joining us. Every year we have our um, CMT UK conference for the CMT community, uh, which we try to uh, make as inclusive as we can. Uh, this year we have leading professionals from around the world sharing their latest CMT research findings and advice with you. We'll have an interactive element with a live relaxation session, as well as a gentle movement chair exercise session, um, which will hopefully be enjoyable. You can also join a discussion about um, whether organising a session with Rare Minds for CMT UK members would be beneficial. They're giving a talk uh, tomorrow and we'll have a little session after that where we can talk about that. Um, they'll talk about the impact of living with a rare condition can have on your mental health and emotional well-being. At the end of each speaker session, um, there'll be an opportunity to ask each live speaker questions. Simply type up your question in the Q&A tab during the speaker session, and then we'll get through as many of those questions as we can with each speaker. If you need subtitles or, or closed captions, as they're called, they're available for each speaker session. You simply click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. As well as all the speaker sessions, we also have the expo area where you can join live video chats with CMT UK staff members, trustees and the sponsors. The expo area will be open 12.30 to 1.30 on both days. That's kind of beyond that now, but tomorrow at 12.30 to 1.30 and also they'll be open for a bit after the last speaker session on each day. Now, all of this wouldn't be possible without the support we receive. So a big thank you to our main sponsors, Dorset Orthopaedic, and you can find out more about them on, on our website. And they'll be giving a talk tomorrow at 4.30 during the Ask the Sponsors session, along with one of our other sponsors, ShoeFit. And please do come along to that session if you can. And you'll also learn about more about our other sponsors on our conference news page on the website. And I'd also like to thank uh, Farnext, who provide us with a grant, which helps towards this conference as well. Now, the part you've all been waiting for, our first speaker. Alex Russell is a consultant and honorary professor at the UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology, the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and Guy and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. He's undertaken specialist neurology training in London, completing her PhD on Charcot Marie Tooth Disease with Professor Mary Riley at the UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology. Dr. Russell will provide an overview of CMT and outline recent advances in genetic diagnosis and treatments for CMT. And so over to you, Dr. Russell. Thanks very much, Simon, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, it's a great honor. I shall uh, just put up my slides. <clears throat> There we are. Hopefully you can you can see that. Um, so again, thank you very much for the invite. And I was going to talk a bit about um, advances in research advances in Charcot-Marie Tooth disease. Um, and so I'm I'm a neurologist. I'm based at the National Hospital for Neurology, where I do a, a specialist peripheral neuropathy, which is mostly CMT with Mary Riley, and also um, I do. Um, general neurology in a, in a peripheral nerve clinic over at um, Guy's and St. Thomas's. So I'm just gonna, some of this will be just a, a brief recap, but I'm gonna just recap on what, what charcot marie tooth disease is and some of the variants of it. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about experimental therapies that are in development. 
and then talk about clinical trials and then finish off with how you can get involved and how CMT UK has helped to enable that. So Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease is named after the three neurologists who first described a group of patients with similar, with, with well, a group of families with peripheral neuropathy and, term, and the disease was eventually termed Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease. So that was John Martin Charcot and Marie-Pierre in, in uh, saint Petrier in Paris and Howard Tooth um, in the UK. And it was described in 1886, and um, that was obviously before the discovery of DNA. And so, the, the, and that's why CMT is an all encompassing term. You may also hear it referred to as hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy or HMSN, but I personally and many others would tend to just refer to it as CMT. So what is CMT? Well, it's a, it's a disease of peripheral nerves. What do I mean by peripheral nerves? Well, you, if you look here on the diagram here, you've got the brain and the spinal cord. It's in the center of the body. It's the central nervous system. And then you have the nerves in your arms and your legs that are in the periphery. And so a, a peripheral neuropathy is damaged to the peripheral nerves. And there's hundreds of different causes. But if it's hereditary, then we call it CMT or hereditary motor neuropathy. Now, strictly speaking, CMT affects both the motor and the sensory nerves. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I stick a pin in your foot, it sends a message up a sensory nerve, goes all the way up to the spinal cord and to your brain. And then you might feel pain and then you'll send the message down the central nervous system to a motor nerve that goes to a muscle and you'll move your foot. In CMT, it's both the sensory and motor nerves that are affected. And it's usually the longest nerves that are affected first. So you will start often with numbness or weakness in the feet. Now, peripheral nerves are like wires. So in a wire, you know, you have your copper wire and then you have your insulation outside of it the lagging and nerves are very similar so you have this central conducting axon here which is like the copper wire and then that is surrounded by insulation and it's an insulating type of cell called a schwann cell i'm going to move my head out of the way here and so the so you've got your central conducting axon wire and then this axon is surrounded by a Schwann cell, which is similar to the plastic coating of a wire. And why, why is that important? Well, we divide CMT into two types. So we divide the first one, so you have CMT1, and this is when the problem starts in the Schwann cell. Okay. And CMT2 is where the problem starts in the axon. Now, both of them eventually lead to damage to the axon or the conducting wire. But you'll hear people talk about CMT1, so the problem starts in the Schwann cell, and CMT2, it starts in the axon. So that's CMT, and then there are two other diseases that really are variants of CMT. So you'll probably, you may hear of the term hereditary sensory neuropathy. So it's really a form of CMT2, but it mostly affects the sensory nerve fibers and really the ones that are involved in pain. And it's a real problem when you can't feel pain because pain's an incredibly, it's a very protective mechanism. So people burn themselves or get ulcers and not feel them. And so patients with hereditary sensory neuropathy often they will, the disease will present with burns and injuries. Um, but they do will go on to develop some weakness as well. But that's hereditary sensory neuropathy. And then the other type you may hear about um, is um, hereditary motor neuropathy. And this is sometimes called distal hereditary motor neuropathy. And again, this is a, probably a, 
a variant of CMT2, but it mostly affects the motor fiber, so the nerves to the muscles. The sen sensation is often preserved and patients will present with weakness. So that's dividing up CMT into types one and types two. And then we also divide them up based on the patterns of inheritance. And so, so you will hear the term CMT1, which re refers it to being a problem in the Schwann cell demyelinating. And then, um, whereas if it's do, uh, a Schwann cell problem and it's recessive, it's CMT4C, and you can also get X linked. So I'm just going to go and explain now about the different types of inheritance. So in the UK, the most common type of inheritance is autosomal dominant inheritance. Now, genes are, are, are bits of DNA um, that code for things called proteins. And we, eat, for example, so you, you will have a gene for your eye color, for example, and you will inherit one copy, one copy of a gene from mum and one from dad. And in dominant disease, you just need one abnormal gene to get the disease. And if you have, so in here, the father has a, 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 a disease gene here, there is a one in two chance that he'll pass that on. And if he passes it on, his offspring will get the disease. So that's dominant. So one in two chance of passing on the condition. That's the most common type in the UK. The other type is autosomal recessive inheritance. And the, probably the most common recessive disease in the UK is, is cystic fibrosis. And here, in this scenario, you can carry a disease gene, but you don't get the disease. So here, you see mum and dad, they both carry the, the gene, they're carriers, but they have no disease, so they don't know it. And when they have children, they'll pass on either of these. Now, if they pass, both pass on the, norm, the, the normal gene, the child is unaffected. If they both, one passes on the normal one and the other, the abnormal, they'll be carriers. But if each passes on the disease gene, then, then the child will have the disease. So if they're carriers, there's a one in four chance of passing it on. That's more rare in this in this country, but it's but but it's being identified as an increasingly common pattern of inheritance in some types of neuropathy. And then the last one I'm going to talk about, which is re reasonably common in CMT, because the second most common type of CMT, CMTX, follows this pattern. And this is called X-linked inheritance. So there are bits of DNA called chromosomes, and there are X and Y chromosomes that determine your sex. So if you have two X chromosomes, you're female. If you have one X chromosome and a Y chromosome, which is similar but much shorter, you're male. Now, in, in the case, what this means is if you've got a disease gene on the X chromosome, which you do in CMTX, if you're a man, you don't have a good copy on the other side to counteract it. So CMTX is always more, so the X diseases are more severe in men because they don't have another X chromosome. In the case of CMTX and CMT, women are also affected, but much less so because they often tend to turn off the disease gene. But the inheritance is a bit more tricky here. Men are more severe with X and CMT, but they can't pass the condition on to daughters. I mean, to, to sons. They can't pass it on to sons because for them to have a son, they have to pass on their Y chromosome, which is why they have a son but they do pass on the disease gene to all their daughters, but they're much more mildly affected. Women, on the other hand, are more mildly affected, but there's a 50-50 a chance of passing on the disease gene to, to a son or a daughter. Yeah, I can take a question. I can take a question if there's a raised hand in the audience. Hi Beatrice, can I can I can I ask you a question?
Beatrice, we can hear you if you want to ask a question. Um, can you explain the recessive dominance again, please? Of course. Thank you. So at a very simple level, if you've got a if you've got a dominant disease, there's a one in two chance of passing it on to your offspring. Okay, but you only need if you've got a dominant disease, you only need one abnormal gene to get the disease, one copy. Okay. Now in recessive disease, if you've got one abnormal copy, you don't get the disease. But if you see down here with the affected son, you need to have two abnormal copies. Okay. Now, if you have if you have a recessive disease, you you will pass on the disease one copy of the disease gene, but your partner um, will also um, have to be a carrier for there to be a chance of you passing the disease on. So if it's recessive, it's usually pretty unlikely you're going to pass the disease on to any children unless your partner is also a carrier. So that, that's inheritance. And then you will see people refer to different subtypes of CMT with various letters. So CMT1A being the commonest type, CMT1B and CMT1C. And these letters refer to the gene that is causing the CMT. Okay. And so for CMT1, that's demyelinating CMT. Um, CMT1A is by far and away the commonest. And the different letters refer to different genes. And you can see now that we, 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 we now that we've discovered so many genes in that cause CMT, we've now got to the end of the alphabet. Um, and you'll see things like CMT2CC, but the letters refer to the genes. So what about treatments for CMT? Well, I think it's worth saying now that, there, I mean, there already are treatments available and, and there are treatments that can be, can be very, very helpful for patients. And many of you will, will know this firsthand. But orthotics, ankle supports can be, you know, can be can can have a huge impact on people's mobility and independence. There's work being done on exercise that can help. And for some people, not uh, not the, a, a minority, foot surgery can certainly help. So there are treatments available at the moment, but I'm going to concentrate on some of the sort of experimental work that's being done at the moment. So I'm going to start with some experimental therapies. I'm going to start with CMT1A, um, which is the commonest type of CMT in the UK by quite a long way and also globally. And as such, it's had quite a lot of interest from pharmaceutical companies. So what causes CMT1A? Well, it, it, it's basically due to you get bits of DNA called chromosomes. All your DNA is divided up into packages called chromosomes. And in CMT1A, one of those chromosomes, when it divides, it, it basically doubles up a bit of DNA that shouldn't be there. But what that means is that in CMT1A, you have too much of a gene, and that gene is called PMP22. And this PMP22 is a substance that's produced in the Schwann cell. So if you remember, if we go back to the, when I was showing you the picture of the Schwann cell surrounding the axon, people with CMT1A have too much um, PMP22. You may, some of you may have, or you may have heard of another condition called HMPP or hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure causes. Now, in patients with this condition, they have too little PMP22 and they get a different type of neuropathy. But patients with CMT1A produce too much PMP22. So the question is, how are you going to, if you're going to look at therapy for CMT1A, you know, how, what are you going to try and do? Well, what people have tried to do 
is they have tried to generate treatments that reduce the amount of PMP22 that's produced. And you can certainly see the logic in that. i be slightly careful because, as I said, if you don't produce enough, you get this other type of neuropathy, HNPP. And so probably the, one of the, in the more recent times, one of the first drugs that has tried to do this, and I, I see the sponsor for the meeting today is, is this drug, PXT3003 from the company Farnext. And what this um, drug is, and some of you may have been involved in trials, is it's a combination of three, three drugs that are actually used quite commonly in medicine. Um, these drugs are naltrexone, um, baclofen and sorbitol. And there's been some work done in, in the laboratory, um, in mice showing that this combination of drugs reduces the amount of PMP22 that's produced. And the doses of these drugs are, are pretty low. Baclofen's slightly higher, but it's reasonably low. And so, um, and it's thought to be the combination of all three acting together that may reduce PMP22. So there has been a trial of this drug already and it was published. Now, the, 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 the difficulty that, that, that was had was the, there were three different doses and the highest dose, the, um, the, the actual composition of the tablet tended to, to disintegrate. And so people who were taking the tablet knew what they were, which one they were taking. And so it wasn't, if we say blinded. However, in this study, there was a, there was a, a it was there was a suggestion that on the higher dose patients might have improved but like i say people knew what they were taking and so there's been a second trial and that opened to recruitment um about two years ago and hopefully we'll be getting some results from that shortly so that, that's the, that's probably the one of the, you know the in recent times one of the first drugs um, looking at treating um, so what I'll do is I'm going to come to the questions at the end is that all right I think um, so the, the second um, approach is you is a, using a genetic approach to reduce PMP22 expression so how does how do genes result in production of proteins. So you have DNA and that's transcribed into, that's converted into something called RNA, which is very similar. And that is then uh, made into protein. And in, in the case of CM21A, it's too much PMP22. So people have developed synthetic DNA and RNA molecules that bind this step here and they cause this rna to be degraded um and so they reduce the total amount of pmp22 and, and these are very effective if you do if you look in a, in a, in a cell in a, in a test tube this approach is very is is very um effective um, but that's a cell in a test tube not not a human being and the problem that we have with these treatments is how you get that synthetic DNA or RNA molecule into a nerve cell. And it's not easy because if you can see on the left here, you've got a diagram of a nerve and you can see that the actual, the blood supply, you see the blood supply surround outside of where the actual nerve axons are, so these little yellow circles. And the nerves in our body are actually protected from the bloodstream, something called the blood nerve barrier. And trying to get things across the blood nerve barrier is difficult and trying to get things into Schwann cells is difficult. And that's probably the main hurdle at the moment. And people have tried different approaches, trying to get these drugs into the nerves of, of you know, in, in mice with CMT. And so people have generated viruses. So a virus, the way they work is they will have a bit of DNA and they will move, they will, they will, enter a cell and deliver that bit of DNA into a cell so that a protein can be produced. And people have tried 
attaching molecules onto the bits of DNA to try and increase their ability to be taken up by, by nerve cells. But it is the major hurdle, the major barrier to this type of medication is, is actually, as I say, it's delivering it in simultaneously to the Schwann cells. And what you really want, I mean, these aren't things you can take as tablets. Ideally, you'd want to be able to give an infusion into the bloodstream or even a little injection in the tummy. But at the moment, in many of the mouse models, they're actually having to inject into the, into the spinal cord. So that's in the mouse model. So at the moment, um, the, the one's a bit of a way off finding ways to deliver these drugs to nerves for human use. Okay, so in that one, we're talking about um, producing bits of DNA that stop proteins being produced. Now, what about treating types of CMT where there isn't enough of a protein? So when I talked about you know dominance and recessive, in recessive diseases, they tend it tends to be that there's not enough of a particular protein being produced. And in X-linked CMT, which is the second commonest type of CMT in the UK. There's also not enough of the of a protein called connexin. So, how might you be able to treat the you know? So to treat these diseases, you want to produce more of this uh, protein. So, one can do a, a, take a similar approach here. So, rather than um, with CM2 and A, we're trying to give bits of DNA that actually bind to the RNA and stop the protein being produced. In in these diseases, what we do is we want to deliver a bit of DNA really, that can then be converted into a protein. But again, it's the same problems about how you get that bit of DNA into the nerve cell. But it's been done in mice. So there's a group in Cyprus that um, um, we've worked with who have done some work on X-linked CMT and also a recessive type of CMT called CMT4C. And these are both types of CMT, that, of CMT1, that, as I talk about, affect the Schwann cell. And so there, there, you know, there, are, there, are, there are very many mouse models of CMT. So mice who've had mutations introduced that have the disease. And what the, this group in Cyprus did is they generated a virus um, that would enter cells and, and cause uh, this the you know the protein to be produced but only in Schwann cells and what they did quite helpfully is they actually in this model here CMTX they treated mice with this virus when they were very young in childhood but also when they were older in adulthood and that's important because a lot of these treatments in in mice they treat the mice you know soon after birth but that's that's you know, for, for adult for humans, that's not that it's not always um, very helpful because a lot of people are diagnosed later on, and also, um, you know, uh, some of these therapies one's always going to be slightly cautious with the side effects of giving them to very young children. But if you look at these um, graphs here, and this is for CMTX on the E and I, and on the y-axis, this is where they measured the force. So the mice are holding on to a bar and they're pulling them and seeing what force they can generate, and the um, top line. Is the, is the virus that contained the protein that was missing. And the bottom one was like a placebo. And you can see both in the young mice in the top and the more and the aged mice in the bottom, there's a significant improvement with, with the virus that contains the connexin protein. And in the bottom diagram down here, this is for the recessive type of CMT, CMT4C. And again, you've got the force on the y-axis and there was an improvement with this viral therapy. But the problem again is the delivery. So in these mice, they they couldn't get uh, enough expression if they injected it into the bloodstream and they were having to inject these this virus into the into the spinal fluid. So that's viral gene therapy. What about small molecule, small molecule tablets for CMT? Well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to briefly talk about CMT2A. So that's the commonest type of axonal CMT. 
in the UK and its dominance. So CMT2A is due to mutations in, I'll move over there, is due to mutations in a gene called mitofusin 2 and that's abbreviated to MFN2. And these are proteins that are produced in mitochondria. So you can see on the over here, there's diagrams of mitochondria. And, and these are a little bit, in all of the cells in your body, you have mitochondria. Well, that's most of them, not all actually. And what they are is they're like batteries. So they're the energy producing units within all cells. So they're very, very important. And the mitochondria two is required for mitochondria to join together. So you can see here at the very top, you've got two of these red mitochondria, and then they need this gene, the mitofusin 2, to help them join together. And mitochondria need to be able to join and, and, and divide uh, to maintain and repair themselves. And in CMT2A, the mitochondria can't join together properly. Why that causes CMT, we don't know but it, they do, they, they have a problem with joining together. So a group in the, sorry, a group in the, in the US, it's called Mitochondria in Motion, um, have developed small molecule drugs that can potentially be taken as a tablet that help the disease mitofuse in well, help that help, help to um, help mitochondria bind together, even if there is mutant mitofusin too. Um, and there have been some studies in mice showing this might be helpful. And at the moment, they're looking to take this drug into a rat model of CMT2A, which is slightly closer to humans. And I think they are looking to take this into trial, but they're not there yet. So what I'm going to do now is just talk a little bit about clinical trials in, in humans now and uh, what there has been and what what some of the um, what are some of the barriers at the moment for, for research in CMT. I mean, there was a flurry of activity in terms of clinical trials for CMT on A, you know, almost 10 years ago. And that came on the back of a, a study looking at vitamin C in, in a mouse model of CMT one A. And vitamin C was thought to reduce PMP22 production. And there were about five large trials from around the world, and they were all negative. But they were very, very helpful because they taught the, uh, the research community an awful lot about clinical trial design and things that had to be improved for the future. In terms of clinical trials since then, there have, there have been several, but in terms of the big one, there's, there's the Farnex PXT3003 trial. Um, the first one that's already been published and the second one I think is ongoing or may have completed recruitment. There is a, there is a trial at the moment that's being done for a rare, well, it's a reasonably rare, but not that rare type of CMT due to sorbitol dehydrogenase deficiency. It's, it's recessive, it's a motor predominant form of CMT, um, but it, the, 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 this, this type of CMT is due to a, a problem in the breakdown of something called sorbitol. So glucose is converted, so sugar is converted to this substance called sorbitol. And in this type of CMT, there's something that breaks down the sorbitol and that there is and there's a lack of that in the in patients with this disease okay so they get very high sorbitol levels that causes the disease they just happen to be drugs that were already designed for diabetes um that, that prevented the conversion of glucose to sorbitol so these drugs here that are already available are already shown to be safe are currently being tried in this type of cmt but that trial that that study to my my understanding is currently closed to recruitment, so they've recruited enough patients. And there is a another trial that's being conducted is soon to start being conducted by Professor Riley and Dr. Matilda Laura 
at the National Hospital for Neurology, and this is a trial for a type of hereditary sensory neuropathy um, that I mentioned earlier due to mutations in the gene SPTLC1. Um, this is going to be a 12-month trial, and we hope to start recruiting in the next few months. I, I, we're pretty sure we've identified most people with this type of um, hereditary sensory neuropathy in the UK, but if by any chance you have hereditary sensory neuropathy due to this gene, um, and you haven't been contacted, then do let us know. So what are clinical trials? How, how do we conduct them? Well, the mainstay of trials of treatment in this country is what we call a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. What does that mean? Well, it's randomized. So you get your population. So let's say we're going to do a trial of CMT1A. So you get your population of patients with CMT1A. And then if your patient comes on the consent of the trial, you toss a coin and that will decide whether they go into the treatment group or the control group. And that control group is often a placebo. So for the vitamin C trials, it was placebo. The placebo controlled if there's no effective treatment. Clearly, if there's a treatment, then the control group will be whatever treatment's available. And it's double, when they say double blinded, it's double blinded because the participant, the person with CMT doesn't know whether they're getting the drug or the placebo, but it's also blinded to the investigator. So the doctor who's doing the assessments also doesn't know what treatment the, um, the individuals received. Um, and so this is a, a very good design for reducing bias and making sure that um, drugs that are shown to be effective truly are. But it's not that straightforward. There are significant barriers to successful trials in the CMT. And a lot of this was highlighted by the vitamin C trials. And one of the main problems is outcome measures. But what do I mean by an outcome measure? I mean, how do you, how do you accurately measure how active somebody's CMT is and in, in, such a, in such a way that's accurate if you repeat that assessment the next day it's the same okay and if and that, that is not easy um, and the other issue is about patient recruitment particularly for rare subtypes of CMT so I think this I'm going to show this slide here and this is really to illustrate the problem with outcome measures so some of you may have been involved in this. There was a trial of vitamin C for CMT1A almost 10 years ago. And what you'll see here in this graph here on the y-axis is this outcome measure called the CMT neuropathy score. And that's a score that are, assesses people's hand function, how they walk, their examination findings, and also the electrical tests that they have. And what you see at the bottom here is the months. And in blue are those, well, the one to look at is the red. So this is the, in the red are patients who received placebo, so a sugar-coated pill. And what you'll see is over a two-year period, the 24 months, the score didn't change. Okay. Now that, that is a that is a problem because the most most people consider that for a treatment for CMT, the, the aim is to stop the disease progressing. It may be unrealistic to expect there to be a significant improvement. You're expecting things to stop progressing. So if, you, if your, your measurement here can't detect progression over two years, then you're, 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 you're not going to be able, your trial is not going to be able to tell if a drug is effective or not. So after these trials, we realized that this, this, this score here, this neuropathy score as it was, wasn't really good enough um, to be used for trials in the future. Otherwise we risk trialing effective drugs, but just not being able to tell if they worked or not. And this is a problem for diseases that are slowly progressive. If you've got a very rapid disease, it's much easier to see if the treatment works or not. So how can we measure disease activity in CMT? And that's been a major um, question and interest of the group. 
So one thing you can do is you can you can do a clinical assessment, and that's what this CMT neuropathy score is. And and that assessment has been adapted um, since the original vitamin C trial, um, and it's used some clever statistics to make it more more sensitive. So this score asks individuals about the symptoms, how much numbness extends up the legs. If they have difficulty with using their hands, with buttons, if they use have ankle foot orthotics, use sticks or a wheelchair, and then examination findings, so sensory examination, examining their arms or legs, assessing the strength, and adding that to the electrical tests. So that that the CNT neuropathy score has been adapted from the vitamin C trials and is more sensitive. Another thing we've tried to look at is, is a blood test that might be helped to monitor disease activity. And what you really want is you want a blood test that can detect breakdown of nerve fibers. So within nerves, and you can in the diagram here, you can see this, this neuron here. So this big bit on the left, the neuron, that's that bit will sit around the spinal cord, and then the other end is in the muscle or the skin and you've got the long axon that connects the two and within that there are these things called neurofilaments and there are structural proteins that maintain the integrity of the neuron and when a nerve is damaged they're released into the blood at very very low levels but there have been significant advances in how you can measure them and you can now detect levels of these in the blood and so we have looked at these blood levels in patients with CMT and in healthy controls. And what you can see is, so each of these on the left here, all these circles are individual, are individuals. So the first thing is there's quite a lot of overlap. So there are, there are if you see there are well, supposedly healthy individuals with quite high levels, but on average, most of them are below patients with CMT1 or hereditary sensory neuropathy or connexin. And then the other graph, is looking at the level of these neurofilaments in the blood and how severe somebody's CMT is. And they do appear to correlate. So the higher the blood level, the more severe the CMT appears. Well, we've actually gone on and we've had patients who've been very, very helpful. And we've repeated this now after a six year period. Um, and, and it's interesting because actually on that, in, depending on the cyber CMT, we tend to see a, a slight drop, if anything, over a six year period. But there's significant variation. Um, so when you repeat somebody's blood tests, it does vary an awful lot. And if you try and work out how many patients you'd need, if you were using this blood test to work out if a drug worked, you'd probably need about 10,000 patients in a trial. I mean, that, and that's just unrealistic in, in some you know rare types of CMT, there probably aren't 10,000 patients in the world. So the blood test seemed like a good idea. It's easy to do, but it's probably not the answer. So the other promising angle that, that's been looked at by uh, colleagues of Jasper Morrow and Mary Riley is muscle MRI. So when, a, when a, ner a nerve to a muscle is damaged, it causes muscle weakness. So no message can get from the nerve to the muscle. So I, I ignore what I've said damaged nerves are replaced by fat. What I mean is the damaged muscle so when a nerve, a muscle is disconnected from a nerve, it starts to be replaced by fat. And you can accurately measure the amount of fat in a muscle using an MRI. And so you can see here, in the top is the control, healthy individual, baseline and repeated after 12 months. And the black muscle here, this is cut through the bottom of the leg, the black muscle is very healthy. Fat appears white. And you can see here in the patient with CMT1A, some of the muscles are appearing white due to the fat being deposited. And if you repeat the MRI after 12 months, there's actually an increase in the amount of fat. Um, and it's quite accurate. So muscle MRI does appear to be able to detect disease progression, well, fat accumulation in, in CMT1A. So what I've done here is I've actually said, if we were to have a clinical trial of a drug for, for CMT1A, and we'd be using different outcome measures, how many people would we need? So remember when I said about the blood test, we'd probably need about 10,000. For the CMT neuropathy score, the original one, that we, for the vitamin C, you probably need about 7,500. 
using some of the more op the, the 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 optimized sort of CMT neuropathy scores and similar ones for children, and you're reducing that to about 80. If you're using muscle MRI and you're selecting patients who've got a certain amount of fat in the muscle, you can get away with much, much smaller numbers of patients to a, a level that would be realistic to perform a, um, a proper clinical trial. The problem with muscle MRI is it's not, um, it's it what we call a surrogate biomarker. So it's not quite as good as a patient assessment. So I'm just going to finish off now with um, the final issue, which is about recruitment. So there are, there's difficulty in identifying individuals with rare types of CMT for trials, for which there may be a handful of people in a single country. I think there's issue around geographical inequality, where you are in the country and access to clinics that are recruiting for research. And a lot of individuals with CMT, and, and this, this is perfectly valid, you know, don't, don't see a neurologist or don't need to see a neurologist, but as a result, it becomes more difficult to be involved in research if you want to. And so I think, we, you know, I'd like to uh, a big thank you to CMT UK for this, but we, we're we starting to develop a UK-wide CMT database. Um, I've got some slides of the, the, the prototype at the moment. So this is going to be a database or a registry where individuals with CMT in the UK, if they wish to, can register their interest for being contacted about future research studies. And it's going to be via a web link. So people will be able, and, and that, one, that, that web link will hopefully be included in the CMT UK website amongst other places. And individuals will be able to register from there. And so this is the prototype um, opening page at the moment. It's still, individuals will be asked to complete a consent form. We're hoping to have this available both for children and adults. And then we will ask people for some details about what type of CMT they have, if they've seen a, a neurologist or a geneticist, if they would provide us with some details and allow us to contact them to get to get further details of the exact genetic diagnosis. And the hope of this is we'll have, it will enable people to who would like to be involved in research, but um, who haven't been able to so far, to to put their name forward the registration won't require a healthcare professional so that will hopefully remove a barrier at the moment we're just applying for ethical approval because obviously it will require sensitive information to be stored on a secure database but we're just going through the ethics at the moment and i'm very open for any suggestions or comments from people about how they think it should be done or if they've got any comments on how it could be improved but i would like to say thank the cmt uk for helping to fund that and with that i'd sort of like to thank my colleagues um, at the national hospital mary riley who you all know i think is the patron of cmt uk matilda laura but also Gita randari um roy and mary are nurse specialists in cmt uk so thank you very much i'm happy to take any questions Thank you so much for that, Alex. There's some questions in the uh, question bar. If, if you'd like me to um, to read them to you, if, if that would help, I've got a question from uh, Simon Lindsay, who asks, "What type of what subtype of CMT type two is connect has connected gastric problems, or may carry or come with a wide range of inherited problems?" I mean, there are types of inherited neuropathy that can be associated with abdominal problems. Um, I mean, there, and there are. I mean, there is quite. It's quite. It's quite a complicated question. Um, and there are there are other types of rarer types of inherited neuropathy that can have multi-system involvement, not, but not typically CMT. But it can also just be unrelated. You know, unrelated, and that's one of the difficulties. Sometimes, I think. You know, patients with CMT have is you, everything gets attributed to the CMT, and sometimes it could be something else. So, 
but difficult to comment i'm afraid sorry that's okay uh, i i have a, i have a comment from uh frank gibb who says um fantastic treatment synthetic protein very helpful mm. uh very hopeful and jeff is asking is nmus now being used by neurologists in the uk to help with diagnosis and treatment of cmt I think, I, I, yeah, I think you mean, uh, do you mean neuromuscular ultrasound? Is that is that what the NMUS means, um, Jeff? Um, I'm guessing it is. I mean, so ultrasound um, can pick up thicker nerves, but you can get thicker nerves in other types of peripheral neuropathy that aren't CMT. Um, I have to say, I've not found, you know, MR, you can do MRI as well to look for thickness. I've never found it. I've never, it's, it's, sometimes it's helpful. I've never found it particularly helpful in differentiating between the two. I've found it more help. I found people who've been diagnosed, who've got CMT, who've found to have thicker nerves, who've then, it's been misinterpreted and have been diagnosed as an inflammatory neuropathy and put on treatment. Um, I've always tended to find, listening to the history, the old fashioned clinical examination, clinical history slightly more helpful than then genetic testing but but some places are doing ultrasound um of nerves in so it is happening okay um we'll, the next question is from richard yeah i'll put it yeah you got it in front of you um about bioelectrics um, I do to read it out, Simon. Would that be easy? I can go down if you want. So, yeah, if, you, if you're yeah. happy to, yeah. I've seen a lot in papers in the popular press about bioelectrics. It is suggested the signals that tell genes what body part they are can be generated to persuade the body to generate a damaged element. Is there any potential that eventually a damaged nerve resulting from CMT could be repaired in this way? Or is there a clear mechanism that will make this impossible? The, the, the short answer, I'm afraid, is I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what bio, I'm not, bioelectrics is a slightly new new thing to me. I mean, the thing with the thing about with nerves, if the nerve cell dies, if the, the, the nucleus in the spinal cord dies, then that nerve can't regenerate. From some post-mortem studies we've done in some types, at least, it looks as though the end of it dies back and the cell body is preserved. So, you know, I don't... I don't think one can ever say there is there isn't a capacity for regeneration but obviously the longer somebody has had significant wasting for the less likely it is that it's going to come back even with an effective treatment hence the aim to try and reduce progression and craig southern gene therapy or new drugs might halt disease progression however for established disease is there any potential for lost nerve muscle so it, the, So for the, um, if you look at other diseases, other nerve diseases that aren't genetic, so let's say we look at, I treat patients with immune nerve problems, so where the immune system attacks the nerve. So we can stop that quite easily. We can, we, we're not, we can stop that with immune suppressing drugs. They do then, will then get some recovery. Um, some of them can get a significant recovery, but if there's if there's significant damage for a prolonged period of time, then they don't recover. So I think you know there may be in the short term there may be maybe some prospect for recovery, but um, in the long term it's probably halting progression. So how do do you think CMT one B or other types as well as one A will be eligible to be treated by gene silencing in the future, or is it only for one A? Um, so the one A is slightly, you know, you've just got to reduce the amount of the gene. There are there are other there are other treatments for CMT one B that are being developed. So there are some tablet, there's some drugs, because with CMT one B it's another protein in the Schwann cell, and there's some evidence that it gets stuck in a certain part of that cell, and there are drugs that try and reduce that stress. So they're being tried in mice. You can actually. There are people who are you trying to use genetic treatment, but with little bits of DNA that only bind to the um, to the mutated gene, um, which is quite a difficult thing because a mutation is just one little letter that's different in sort of 
you know, 100,000 letters. Um, so there are some gene therapies being looked at for other types of symptoms, CMT1B and um, 1E and many of the other types. Yeah, do, and do, so yeah, what does this mean for those who have complete deletion of PMP22? Well, you're right. So the, if you've got if you've got hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies and a deletion of PMP22, the last thing you want is a gene therapy to reduce it further. Um, it, the, 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 the difficulty with things like, you know, with some of these, with HMPP is, um, you know, theoretically, you could generate a virus that would produce more PMP22. But one has to get the balance right between the risks of a treatment um, and the benefits. And, um, you know, vi viral gene therapy are ultimately in, in inserting bits of DNA into a cell. For HMPP, it's often, um, for HMPP, it's often um, not, um, you probably wouldn't want to, Mike, so you probably wouldn't want to be, um, um, having a viral gene therapy, I think the, probably the risks probably outweigh the um, benefits and there's probably more that can be gained by um, trying to avoid exposing oneself to pressure palsies. I think that's all the questions we have at the moment. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Russell, for your presentation. That was um, really interesting, really helpful. I particularly like the, the clear and simple way you've explained CMT at the beginning, um, which I, I think really helps to put it into perspective where the different types are um, within CMT. So, um, so thank you for that. And it's, it's of course interesting to see the different therapies that, that are being worked on around the world in in, in US and in Cyprus and wherever that that's, um, hopefully will come to fruition in in, in time. One, one hopes. It's, um, so. And thank you for answering the questions. It's, it's been a really uh, informative session. Thank you so much for that. And we uh, look forward to working with you on the uh, on the database soon. Well, well, thanks, you, thanks for your support on that. You know, yours and CMT UK is really, really valuable. Thank you. And thanks for your time. Take, take care. Now, the next session we have coming up this afternoon is, let me just check my, um, is Tessa Craver at um, 3 p.m. Uh, I hope you're going to join us for that. Uh, meanwhile, you've got half an hour now for a, a quick um, cup of tea and a, and a biscuit or, or whatever, and hopefully see you at three o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>